Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to a wonderful night of partners in Torah. Thank you all for coming tonight. We had a great night of learning, and we're going to have an amazing speaker again tonight, a regular here at Partners in Torah. We owe him a great debt of gratitude for sponsoring again tonight's Partners in Torah's excellent food. Thank you very much, Nathaniel Tarlow. We'd like to invite you up for a few words of Torah. coming out and uh, joining your partners in study tonight. This program is so important and it's really critical that you and your partner make it as consistently as possible and keep this facility full of learning and full of life. Thank you for doing that. I want to take some time to talk to you all about Parashat Vayishlach. That's this week's parasha, And uh, like a lot of Parashot, it's loaded with all sorts of lessons, all sorts of things we can learn and examples from the Torah for our lives. And uh, I certainly don't have time to devote hours to, and it's worth several hours, I don't have time to devote several hours to this, so I want to take some of the concepts, some of the main takeaways, and talk about those things tonight. Now, this particular parasha is an exciting one because it is the reunion, after 20 years apart, of twin brothers Esau and Jacob, and that was a rather dramatic, rather fraught reunion or so we're led to believe in the run-up to it. And I want to talk a little bit about the history behind that. And as you all know, Esau and Jacob were the twin sons of Isaac and Rebekah. And that's important because not only are they twins, meaning they're carried at the same time, but they're both boys. So we are going to possibly have a birthright controversy, a birthright question. And we start to see the struggle early on even prior to the birth, it's written in the Midrash that when Rivka passed a house of idolatry, that Esau would struggle to get out of the womb, and that's where he was oriented. And when she would pass a house of worship for the people of Israel, for God, that Jacob would struggle to get out of the womb, because that's where he was oriented. And Esau is not somebody in the Torah who is really looked upon very, uh, he's rather dimly viewed, to put it mildly. But the important lesson among many in this parasha is that you can still learn something. You can even still see a good episode of conduct from an otherwise bad person. Now, uh, Esau, you could definitely say, is somebody who has some serious bad traits to his name. And some of those translated into actions, including murder, sexual assault, idolatry, and a host of other really bad things. He was described as a wild man, somebody who was a hunter, a man of the field, a rough, hairy, uh, rough and tumble type. And that is contrasted against Jacob, who was gentle, unassuming, and generally treated as, as a wise and good person. So, where does all this drama begin? Well, we go back to what I said a moment ago, when they were twins, they were carried at the same time. Somebody has to be born first. Well, who was that somebody? That somebody was Esau. How do we know? Because the text makes it very clear that Jacob was born holding the heel of Esau. So chronologically speaking, Esau is the firstborn, which puts him in the first position to inherit his father's birthright and blessing. Uh-oh, that's not good. Because as we know, this is not a great guy. So one day, he goes to the field to hunt at his father's instruction. His father said, hey, bring me back some venison and... Later on, he comes back hungry, famished, and 
supposedly sells his birthright to Jacob for a bowl of porridge. Then later on, as Isaac is going to convey the birthright, by this point his senses, particularly his eyesight, dulled by old age, he's rendered blind. The mother of both twins, Rebecca, realizes who's who in knows who's who amongst her sons, and she plots with Jacob to deceive Isaac into giving the birthright to Jacob in lieu of Esau, to whom we're led to, we, we learn from the text he intended to give it. How did this happen? As we mentioned, Jacob was hairy. I'm sorry, Jacob was smooth-skinned. Esau was hairy. So Rivka has animal skins put over the arm of Jacob, and it presents him to a now blind and uh, hard of hearing and otherwise, uh, otherwise diminished by age, Isaac. And Isaac conveys the birthright to Jacob, thinking it was Esau. Now, Esau's not a guy to be trifled with. He's known to be hot-tempered. He's known to be violent. He's known to be a bad guy. And Jacob realizes this. So Jacob has to flee. But before that happened, Esau went to his father and said, Hey, Dad, that's, you don't understand. You've been tricked. You gave the birthright to Jacob. You meant to give it to me. And what is Isaac's response? I have but one birthright to give, one blessing to give. I've given it. It's not revocable anymore. Now Esau's rage is pretty serious. So what does Jacob do? Jacob flees to go and be with his uncle Laban in Haran. And there, ironically, we learn that Jacob gets a taste of his own medicine because he too is deceived. How is he deceived? He works seven years as a field servant, believing that Laban is going to give him his daughter, Rachel, the one he wanted, the one he bargained for, for seven years of labor. Seven years of labor go by, Jacob gets ready to be married, lifts the veil, and who is it? It's Leah. So Laban goes, oh, whoops, did I trick you? How about this, another seven years of work, and I can hook you up with Rachel. And what does Jacob do? He does the seven years of work. So there's a couple of lessons to be learned here, okay? Uh, one thing is that you see in the Torah, a concept of what goes around comes around. But later on, we learn a more important lesson. Word comes to Jacob that uh, he wants he's to go back to the Holy Land, the land of his fathers. He's been out in Haran for 20 years. And so he's worried about the fact that Esau is waiting to meet him. And that he sends an emissary to give word to Esau to set up this reunion and comes back and says, look, your brother will receive you, Jacob, but he's got 400 armed men. Take that to mean whatever you want. So Jacob makes preparations in a couple of different ways. One, he prays to God. Another, he divides his camp. The logic being if one camp is attacked, the other will escape during the attack. And thirdly, he prepares gifts in the form of animals to Esau. And the drama really gets high. And the meeting happens. And how it happens is that Jacob sends servants staggered out with gifts for Esau and finally meets Esau. And Esau not only has forgiven his brother, but this is really what we learn from Esau. Esau has clearly long since let go of the anger that he had toward his brother. Because as the gifts are coming, Esau actually says, hey, look, um, I've done pretty well for myself. You don't need to give me these animals. I'm doing just fine. I'm quite wealthy. As you can see, I don't need these animals. And Jacob says, no, I really want you to have them as a tribute of my respect. And to Esau's credit, he says, all right, well, if it would make you feel better, then I will accept them under those terms because you, I don't want you to feel like I've turned you down. And Esau even goes an extra step. After they embrace, after they weep together, they, uh, they shake hands and, and they bury the hatchet. And Esau even says, hey, you're on the move right now, journeying from Haran back to back to the Holy Land, I'll send my men to escort you. I'll make sure you get there safely. And there's a really important lesson to be learned from that. And that is that even somebody with bad character traits can still teach you something, can still have a good episode that you can learn from. And the Torah is telling us, don't write off a person in their entirety, no matter what their past. You can still learn something from that person. And more importantly, even if the messenger isn't a very good messenger, that does not mean the message isn't a valid message. The message can still be valid, even if delivered by a flawed messenger. And in this instance, Esau's message of forgiveness, of letting go of anger, is a very good one. 
And it's definitely connected. The fact that Esau has waxed rich with the fact that Esau has long since let go of the anger toward his brother. Because Esau was certainly in a position to take revenge against his brother. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment, but revenge is something the Torah does not really like. And that, too, is actually something that is touched upon in this parasha. So, had Esau been obsessed with seeking revenge against his brother, it would have distracted him from building his... His, from building himself up, from building up his estate. And clearly the fact that he didn't turn, to compare this to American literature, that he didn't turn into Captain Ahab chasing Moby Dick and making it an obsession that destroyed him is really to Esau's credit. Because Esau was able to let go of that particular injury and do what? Move on from it. And Jacob too was able to let go of anger toward Laban and move on from it and still prosper and still marry Rachel, even though both instances were a setback. Now, I know what you're thinking, but wait, but wait, didn't, didn't Jacob buy Esau's birthright? Didn't Esau, Esau sell the birthright to Jacob? Not really. I mean, yes, there was a transaction that occurred, but what did Esau really have? He had an option to sell, but the birthright itself, that wasn't Esau's to sell any more than it was Jacob's to buy. It was Isaac's to convey, and only Isaac could be the one to sell it or withhold it or give it. So before you start thinking, oh, no, 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 this was purchased. Well, if it was purchased and it was so legitimate, why did Rebekah have to go about this ruse with Jacob to trick Isaac? Why wouldn't they just go, hey, Isaac, you know, the boys uh, kind of sold this among themselves, so that's that. And the reason why is because it was Isaac's right, and only he could sell it. And he, didn't, he wasn't involved in that transaction. So Esau's, Esau's anger at Jacob wasn't totally illegitimate. In any event, Esau showed tremendous character in that one instance by not only letting go of the anger and not making it an obsession to take revenge, but by going a step further and really making up with his brother and offering to escort his brother safely into the land of, of, of Isaac where, his, uh, where both of their father and mothers dwelt. And that's a really important lesson. It's a real honoring of your mother and father, nonetheless, to be able to do that. On another level, it's a, it's a mitzvah. It's also a mitzvah to dwell in the land of Israel, which ironically, Esau probably did a better job of than Jacob, at least up until that point. I'm not here to defend Esau, but as a criminal defense lawyer, I kind of feel like I, I, have, to, <laughs> I have to cut for him a little bit. Now, the parasha moves on, and we now focus on Jacob, who goes to Shechem. And what happens in Shechem? He's there, and his daughter Dina is out exploring the area when Shechem, which is the name of the city and the name of the prince and the name of the king of the area, when Dina goes out exploring and the prince of Shechem, named Shechem, sexually assaults her, but becomes attached to her, his soul becomes attached to her in such a way that he goes to his own father, King Shechem, and they approach... <coughs> they approach Dina's family to try to actually get her married to Prince Shechem. And speaking for their father, Jacob, Shimon and Levi say, hey, you know, they're, they're enraged. They're angered, and rightfully so. And I'm not saying, nor were they, that the perpetrator, Shechem Jr., shouldn't be held to account. But in their anger, the two brothers plot revenge. And they say, well, we can't even talk about a marriage of our sister to a guy like that, prince or not a prince, if he's not circumcised. So we're going to need all the men in Shechem to undergo circumcision right now, and then we'll talk about it. We'll see about a dowry and all those things. And so the prince of Shechem, so enthralled by Dina, has the entirety of the men in his city undergo circumcision in accordance with the plan that the two brothers had concocted and while they're, two days later, while they're in tremendous pain, the brothers go into Shechem and literally kill every last male in the place. Wow, that's quite some vengeance, isn't it? And it's easy to say that it was richly deserved. And certainly for Shechem Jr., it probably was. Well, what was Jacob's response? You would think maybe he would say, wow, guys, great job. You really showed them. Not at all. He rebuked them for going way overboard and taking revenge and said, hey, thanks a lot, boys. Now you got me in a lot of trouble with the Canaanites, and now we're going to have conflict with them, and you've gone way too far, and your revenge is going to cause a heck of a lot of problems in the future. So there's a lot to be learned from this parasha. We as people not only can learn something from a flawed messenger, a positive message can come from a flawed messenger, 
But one of those is that letting, letting go of anger is an incredibly important thing to do if we are to progress in life. Both Jacob got over his anger at Laban, and surely he was not happy with Laban, and persevered in spite of the setback and made a great name for himself. And even Esau, an otherwise, uh, an otherwise dimly viewed character in our Torah, at least in this instance, admirably let go of his anger toward his brother and became rich and successful in his own right. And the forgiveness component that they had was really important because they were able to honor their, their father and mother. And in fact, toward the end of the parasha, what do the brothers do? They get together and they bury their father Isaac, our forefather Isaac. And only then do they part ways once and for all, which is another lesson. You have, it's good to forgive somebody. It's good to let go of anger. It doesn't mean you have to be friends. That's not required of you. But certainly it's admirable to forgive and move on. And that's what the brothers did. And last but not least, revenge, no matter how richly deserved, no matter how sweet it may feel, generally speaking, only leads to more problems. And these are some important life lessons that we can take from the characters of this, this parasha teaching us and apply to our lives all the time, because certainly we have a lot to learn every day from our Torah. Amen. Thank you.